Good afternoon and welcome to the Justice Subcommittee on Policing's first meeting of 2016. Can I ask members to switch off mobile phones and others uh, and other electronic devices? Uh, the convener has submitted her apologies due to ill health and understanding orders. The oldest member present must chair the, the meeting for the purpose of choosing a temporary convener. And that's why I have taken the chair today. No comments, thank you. Uh, can I have nominations for temporary chair, please? Just stay in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> OK, only one nomination has been received. Uh, and I ask the subcommittee to agree that I be chosen as the temporary convener. Agreed. Thank you very much. Our main item of business today is an evidence session on police complaints handling. Uh, and I welcome to the meeting Chief Superintendent Carol Ald, Head of Professional Standards, Police Scotland, Ian Ross, Chair of the Complaints and Conduct Committee, Scottish Police Authority, and Kate Frame, the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner. And before we start, I'd like to remember members that we own, remind members we only have one hour in which to ask, ask uh, questions of witnesses because we need to be finished by 2 p.m. when the chamber uh, reconvenes. I therefore ask members to keep their questions as concise as possible. And I'll now go to questions from members. John. Yeah, thank you, Kavina. Good afternoon, panel. Um, it's, it's a question for uh, Chief Superintendent Ald. Uh, we have a, a submission from the Scottish Police Federation, um, and they tell us that. Um, the 2014 regulations were intended to move misconduct investigations from adversarial to inquisitorial, inquisitorial in nature. Has that been achieved? Yeah. I think there's still work in progress. Um, most certainly, the situation of the 2014 regs is full revelation for the chair and for the officer subject to misconduct. Um, there, is, there are some questions around about how that plays out in terms of complainers and witnesses and where they, you know, the, the quality of how we apply the regs. So there is some work to be done there. And also when there's a course of conduct, arguably, although this is yet to be established, there may be the occasion when officers and witnesses are presented to two separate hearings because the course of conduct may precede the 14 regs. We are currently managing three sets of regulations, 1996, 2013 and 2014, and that can be challenging for officers and witnesses and complainers alike. OK, thank you. It's also suggested in, in that sub submission uh, that superintendents with portfolios for conduct matters do not understand such important matters as what does and doesn't constitute misconduct. That's quite a, a serious statement. Could yes, you comment on I've, that? I've please? certainly read the submission, but without the detail. Uh, there certainly has been training of the new regulations, which were rolled out throughout 2013-14, and that training continues. Professional Standards Department are fully engaged with divisions through superintendents who lead and support the super support at division. And there is consistency applied with the regulations across the force as best we can within professional standards and the regional hubs and divisions. Do know, uh, Chief Superintendent, you get the opportunity to see the five bullet points which relate to things about uh, not only a, a grasp of um, the regulations process and indeed the limitations of the powers. Um, the use of personal opinions, including heresy, to infer, to help infer guilt, and I'm quoting here, obviously, um, a misunderstanding about the balance of probabilities. Um, it's called evidence is often completely ignored by investigating officers. So it's, it's beyond those charged with uh, the concerns are beyond those charged with deliberating at a hearing, but also into the investigation officers. Has there been training rolled out and about the new regs for that as well? Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And officers are fully conversant with ex exculpatory evidence, both from criminal and civil proceedings. There may be occasions that the Scottish Police Federation would wish to bring forward to professional standards to myself, and I would welcome that. Uh, SPF have full access unfettered to PSD for any such scenarios, but unfortunately neither of these instances have been brought to my attention. So okay. I'm sure that I'll be able to take that up with SPF in my role as head of department. Okay, okay. That, 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 would be, that would be helpful, I'm sure. There, there's also mention of the, um, excuse me, the counter-corruption unit and its relationship with your professional standards department. There seems to be a lack of clarity in, in the mind of this SPF, where that sits and where responsibility sits. And again, a series of comments you will have read about that. Can you comment on that, please? Only in as much as to say, as uh, members will be aware, that the HMIC review has the terms of reference as a matter of public record now. And there are touch points within that review, as I understand it. 
I'm um, sorry, I, I should say that this not relating, I mean, this is obviously historic in, in, in advance of that. I, I, I took it simply to relate to ongoing matters Process. of misconduct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, on the occasion that the Counter Corruption Unit have an investigation which does not go down a criminal route, then there is a, a handover to professional standards for our independent assessment on the full circumstances and a new investigation, where necessary, will be convened under the 2014 regs. So, so just to clarify, when, when there's a suggestion of that the Department acts with impunity and with scant regard for the rules of fairness and proportionality, is that something that concerns you? I would have to have some examples of that, and unfortunately before today I haven't had that brought forward. Mm -hmm. But will you um, be seeking these examples now then? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thanks I very just much. did not feel it was appropriate to comment in advance of today. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, a couple of other questions, if I may, please. Yeah. It's for, it's for Mr Ross, and, and the, the dip sampling role, Mr Ross, that the authority play, how, how does that pan out? C can you explain, is it a, I mean, obviously it's a, a check of, is it more than process, is it about the inquiry too? Um, we've, uh, we have a, a firm procedure in place, we actually piloted first, and now intention is to um, carry out a, a dip sample in advance of each of our regular committee meetings and then bring a report to it. Um, the process as it stands is that uh, it can, it's primarily um, our officers, but uh, board members can also be involved, but they would actually identify either on a random basis or if there was a, a good reason, perhaps either geographical or otherwise, to look at some specific areas of complaints. Uh, they would then go and they would actually look at the files. Some of that, I think, comes off the computer system, the Centurion system. So they would look at the full entity that is the file that relates to that complaint. I would emphasise, of course, it's a closed complaint, so it's reached that point of conclusion. And really, they're, you know, they're looking at all aspects of that complaint, the way it was handled, the evidence, the presentation of the information, the consistency of the conclusion with the, uh, the information that's actually contained within the, within the complaint. And I suppose what we're looking for is reassurance that we're happy with the way it has been conducted. It could very well be, uh, this hasn't happened as yet, but it could very well be that there may be subsequent issues that we want to look further into. Um, so, to some extent, it can lead to further discussion. But it's, it's essentially a, an assurance exercise. And it also, it's an opportunity, I suppose, for us to make sure that we fully understand the approach that's adopted by professional standards as well. I, I was going to pick up on that point, because clearly, with the potential for three regulations to apply to even a closed com complaint, that, is there training for, for authority members on, on the, the process? Yes, uh, we have, uh, well, not just for authority members, but also for authority staff who are involved with complaints. And there's a range of, uh, of developments that we have in place. Um, we have uh, regular contact with key agencies. Uh, we have workshops that we have every six months for our um, complaints board members. Uh, we identify themes that we actually want to develop training themes, information themes, and uh, also on an ad hoc basis we will take forward um, additional briefings and information which may be related to things that have developed just to make sure that our members are up to, up to speed, have a full understanding. And in fact, in relation to some of the regulations, some of our members, probably all of our members, have actually attended in a sort of observer participant basis some of the formal training sessions that Police Scotland and others actually organise. Okay, thank you. Um, two, two small questions, if I may. One, I think we touched on the last time you were here, and it's how you, the authority deals with a complaint that comes in that's effectively a service complaint but names the individual chief officer. Um, so, um, and, and I presume that some of these do come in, so it's not, it's really about the police service performance rather than the individual post holders' performance. Well, I mean, it's the same approach that we take when we get any complaint. There is an assessment process that's gone through. And um, essentially, it's part of what we would call the preliminary assessment. So we look at the complaint, we look at the information that is there. The critical thing is to try to identify what the heads of complaint are. Uh, if, if we can, we engage with the, the person who has raised the complaint to make sure we have a full understanding of it. It could be that we're looking for additional information. Um, uh, also, clearly we don't carry out an investigation at that stage, but we may look for additional context to make sure we have that full understanding. Then depending on the nature of that complaint, um, uh, it would in all probability then be taken to a complaints committee, a report is produced, um, the pr complaint is presented to the committee members and the committee members then form a view 
and that would be in line with the appropriate regulations and whether that's a service complaint, a complaint in terms of other aspects of conduct and then depending on uh, the view that's adopted by the committee at that stage it would then move on to a further stage. It could be a referral to PERC and that does happen, it's, it's not a common but it, it, or it could be that it's clearly that the complaint is unfounded and as part of the process clearly we acknowledge the complaint we give regular updates on the process of the complaint to the complainer and the people who are the subject of the complaint so that they're very clear in terms of what the position is. And then we move to some form of appropriate closure or further investigation with another party. OK, and finally, just one thing. I think in my day they would have been called vexatious complainers, but the unacceptable, persistent or unreasonable actions by complainers, um, the, the information we have from the authority is that two of people have been subject to this policy to date. Are you able to see what either of them straying in theory of criminality, in other words, false accusations of, of, of crime? Um, to be honest, I don't have the immediate recall of the detail. I think, and I, I caveat it with that important point, it was more about the tone that they adopted in terms of their engagement and inter inter interaction with staff. And clearly there is a laid down procedure, it's a policy that's been approved and it's also subject to review. And the other thing I would make very clear is just because someone has been subject to an unacceptable actions policy it doesn't mean of course that their complaint doesn't go through the full process it is still treated like any other complaint just because someone maybe conducts themselves in a way which we might i think objectively consider unacceptable we of course still treat it as a complaint there's no difference of standard there okay that's very sure thanks very much indeed thank thanks. you Good. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I, I want to start, first of all, uh, by looking at the number of complaint cases that there have been, um, an increase of 22.6% across uh, the whole of Police Scotland, um, a reduction in the north by 8.5%, uh, increase by, of 25.1% in the east, um, and a 43.3% increase in the West. Has there been any analysis done to see why it is there is such a huge difference here and why it is that there seems to be a, a decrease in the North which is bucking <coughs> the trend? Superintendent Ald? Yes, um, I can give you some context around about those statistics. We, at the moment, are currently running for the year end of an overall increase of 25.4% for the same financial period last year end, end of year. So at the moment, the figures that we are reporting to Force Performance Board today is uh, an overall year end total of 5,063 complaints, which is an increase of uh, just over, just under 1,000. Um, for the same period last year. Now, I think my colleague at the previous committee uh, explained the introduction of our new frontline front resolution process, which is more than matured now. Um, and we're actually getting to a point of 47% of frontline resolution. And perhaps I can put some context there to the sophisticated model for complaint handling. Which yep, which I think. absolutely uh, brings forward the... <coughs> the position in relation to how complaints are received and handled. Every expression of dissatisfaction is recorded in the frontline resolution desks, and that can vary month on month. Some areas regionally are up or down. The, any expression of dissatisfaction is captured by the FLR, the frontline resolution teams, and 47% of those, so 2,300, 338 of those complaints are dealt with at the lowest level, never getting to a point of investigation, and the officer is made aware of that complaint. So just under half of all complaints received financial year to date last year were resolved within the three-day week process by the FLR teams. And thereafter, anything that requires criminal investigation or further investigation for misconduct comes over into Professional Standards Department, East, West and North, and those inquiries are either retained, depending on the level of allegation, or allocated out to division. Now, we have had specialist services have, are part of that process now, and some of the recorded FLR statistics are captured, for example, in the C3, the communications arena. So that can be around the country, and where the call is received, that is where the complaint is captured for the FLR, the frontline resolution team. 
and there can be a variance around about statistics, and that's just one example of how the stats can be uh, interpreted. Now, we are getting behind those stats to look at individual, individual officer, departmental and force organisational learning across the piece. But I think that it's fair to say that the vast majority of our complaints that are captured now through the frontline capture process for all expressions of dissatisfaction that are dealt with within that three-day process and recorded on our centurion system. And indeed, the more that our st statistics have become more sophisticated, it's allowing us to actually get down to officer, departmental, regional and organisational learning for the force. I accept that there will be variations. And I can certainly take that action to look at more detail behind those statistics that have been brought forward. But there are a lot of variations within the frontline resolution capture. I think one of the things that, that's interesting um, is um, why there are peaks and troughs. Um, and obviously, it seems that nationally there is that increase, but in the north there is that decrease. I'm just trying to s find out if there is a reason for that, because um, uh, there's a level of inconsistency there. Um, it, do you have any inkling of why there is such a difference? Yeah, and I think we, we covered some of this uh, previously around about the consistent recording processes that have been in place since Police Scotland's inception. So you think that previously, um, recording in the north was better than in the east and the west, maybe? Well, I think the capture, certainly, that we are now achieving across the whole of the country is consistent, um, bearing in mind that some of the legacy forces have been incorporated into the west. So we have a number of areas where consistency of both data capture, recording, and how we actually deal with each of the complaints is on a consistent level. And our, toler our toleration around about the recorded complaints are now levelling out across the country at between 550 to 600 a month. But we did see a seasonal variation last month with a drop nationally to 503 complaints for the month of December, but we would normally expect that, having looked back to last year's statistics for the same month. So there are key points during the course of the year that I would see a national seasonal variation. And similarly, when we see dips or exception reporting, then that's where we'll get behind the statistics and to look you, at the variation. And do you think that best practice in dealing with complaints is being exported right across the country? Because we know that some forces in the past uh, we're better at dealing with complaints than others. Well, I do think that is a massive advantage for Police Scotland and the National Force. The ability for us to consistently apply policy, the regulations, recording and data capture. I, I understand that, but do you think that the best practice that there was out there is now uh, being undertaken right across the country? I think it's fair to say that best practice is a continuous journey that we'll be on. Uh, and I personally are looking to set up an organisational a learning forum for the force, which not only captures complaints, but anything that we might identify from procedural reviews, from perp recommendations, <laughs> from internal investigations that we conduct, so that we can discharge both strategic and organisational learning across the force. And that's a new piece of work that's ongoing just now. Mr Ross, what do you think of, uh, of these differences? And uh, do you think that, uh, that consistency is taking place and that best practice is being uh, driven right through the, the entire this is something that we this is something that we tend to probably look at and discuss at every one of our complaints committee meetings and I think particularly as we moved into the application of a of a, a consistent approach across Police Scotland as a whole because clearly initially there was a period where you moved from the let's say the, the different approaches or the approaches that had been historically in place in each of the legacy forces and um, and clearly, we also um, had some fairly detailed discussion about the statistics that you've raised. We wanted to drill down and make sure we could understand what sat behind those. Um, we have, I think, a satisfactory degree of reassurance that it is about now getting a consistent approach and also consistent recording. I think the recording in particular. So that means that um, a complaint is recorded in the same way as a complaint across Police Scotland as a whole. Um, there doesn't appear to be any particular underlying reason in terms of some of the differences that you highlight. Um, but um, also, I think the, the important thing is uh, to focus not just on the complaints and the allegations, 
but also the outcomes from those complaints. And that's another thing that we look at in great detail. And we will continue to look for trends, and we will also look at the sort of the, the time series that is there. And what we are beginning to see is that there is a settling, and I think that uh, um, Carol Ald made reference to that. And we will continue doing that into the, the coming year and beyond. But at the present time, our anticipation that it seems to be settling as one would expect and is also in line with the reassurances we've received from Police Scotland. In, in terms of those trends uh, and uh, the capturing of information, are there any particular areas that people are complaining about more? And when I, I talk about areas, I'm not talking about geographical areas here. Are there any particular issues that are leading to more complaints from members of the public? Uh, there are certain areas that we focused in on, not necessarily because they've been highlighted by members of the public, but because of their presence and their influence on certain officers. And an example, and you may recall, we discussed this, at the, I think the last time I was here, and that was about officers on restricted duties, particularly related to information management. And you know, so there are topics like that that we probably on a very regular basis seek updates, talk about in great detail, both in our public sessions and also in our private sessions with Police Scotland. And we look to make sure that we have a full understanding of what sits behind that, the reasons for it, and what steps can be taken perhaps to, to address it. So that's an example of a, of a particular topic that we look at, and we also look at the trends and the statistics that relate to that. But in terms of particular points that are being raised by the public, not, not, not to the same degree, no. I okay. wouldn't highlight any particular issue. OK. Um, when you've got all of this data and, uh, you know, uh, it, it is immensely important that, uh, that we drill down to find out if there is any particular um, area where, where there are difficulties. And I, I just want to be assured that uh, the, the data that you're capturing is being used to its utmost to try and find out if there are any problem areas at all. Is, I mean, we see that very much as part of our, our key role, as well as dealing with certain complaints ourselves. A key role is the scrutiny of the way in which Police Scotland, through pre professional standards and, and other ways, actually carries out that function. And that's the reason for um, this is a standing item and a standing discussion in public and private sessions within our committee meetings. It's also fits in with the dip sampling. So, for instance, if there was an issue that we felt arose either because of a type of complaint or either because of a geographical aspect of a complaint, then we would be able to factor that in in terms of dip sampling that we would, that we would carry out. And that's part of our planned intention. In terms of uh, vexatious and persistent complainers, which uh, Mr Finney has, has previously covered, um, from my past experience, uh, uh, a lot of these situations have arisen because of very poor communication with the complainer at the beginning, which has escalated to such a, a huge degree. Um, in terms of that uh, uh, frontline resolution response, do you think that that is helping um, in terms of of trying to resolve, and I know you're not going to resolve on every occasion, but trying to resolve folks' concerns at a very early stage? Um, well, certainly in my experience, and we have had uh, detailed reports that have been taken to us on frontline resolution, um, the, uh, the feedback and the analysis that we've taken place has been extremely positive. And I think it also is very helpful in terms of the, the person who's making the complaint, because I think at a very early stage and, and a, in a slightly more informal way, they get the reassurance they're seeking. The critical thing, of course, and in fact, we've, you know, we've sought uh, reassurance in this point, if they are not satisfied at that stage, clearly they can then still escalate it and it can go through the normal process. So, yes, I think we are, uh, and we will continually review it, I think we are impressed uh, at the commitment and the approach that's been adopted with frontline resolution. I have some other questions, yeah, but I'll let really Alison first, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ms Ald, in, in response to Mr Finney, you said the 2014 regs um, were meant to encourage openness and transparency. And um, sort of pulling against in a, that in another direction is what the SPF call a fear of overzealous consequences. Um, are you comfortable that the proportionality um, in relation to misconduct and, and minor misconduct issues it, is at the correct balance? Absolutely. I think 
very complex arena, obviously. But if we look at the frontline resolution and the numbers that we're dealing with at that level, just under half of all complaints received. Then into the middle ground of early interventions, which is a programme of work that Professional Standards engages with, along with the divisions. We meet with officers who have had four or more complaints over a 12-year period, even if there have been no action or no improvement action required. Um, we make the officer and their supervisor aware. We look at what we can do there to support that officer in a learning way, which is the, the thrust of the regulations, as I understand them, of the new regulations. And then we get to the top end of misconduct and gross misconduct. And the number of hearings at the top end of the scale to answer that question about overzealousness. Uh, we have had four hearings in relation to the new regs. So I think when you take that as an overall total of the 5,063 complaints raised since the 1st of April last year, it perhaps gives the panel members some feeling of the structure of where we're at in relation to pushing that out to organisational learning and officer learning at the lowest level that we possibly can in an open and transparent way for all our officers and complainers and witnesses alike who rightly demand uh, no fear or favour in relation to their complaint investigations. Mm -hmm. So you can assure us that it, the, the focus, on, particularly at the, the, the lower end, and it's clearly a spectrum between you know, minor misconduct and, 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 and uh, contractual issues through professional standards and criminal procedures, but at the, the lower end of that spectrum, the, the focus is on learning um, outcomes rather than punitive outcomes? Absolutely. So the regs is quite rightly has been pointed out by Mr Finney also gives us the performance <laughs> aspect there. Uh, there is no doubt that there is work to be done in the force in encouraging the support end of the divisional uh, front end to support officers for the, any warnings of improvement notification. Anecdotally, I am aware of when warning intended uh, improvement notifications being provided to officers when misconduct has been set aside um, and we are looking at how we can continue to record that but it's fair to say on a lot of occasions it doesn't require improvement notification it actually requires supportive learning for the officer we have a six stage form which is completed for every single complaint that comes into the organization and in section five the officer recording that form whether it's frontline resolution or all the way up to misconduct matters must and, uh, record what the organisational or individual learning is, and all of that comes in consistently to myself within professional standards, and we will look at any emerging uh, trends or themes that require addressed at the highest level, either strategically through the organisational learning function that is soon to be established across the force, and much more at the supporting the superintendents at divisional level. And that brings us that consistency nationally across the force. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, when we last um, considered these matters, we were aware of the complex legacy complaints that were, were around. Um, the SPA have said to us that there are five still outstanding. Is that right, Mr. Ross? Um, and I think they, um, you, perhaps you could give us an indication <coughs> of when those are likely to be concluded. I mean, they've been um, you inherited them in 2013. It's quite some time. Yes. Um... I think to some extent we don't have complete control over some of the reasons why uh, those have not been concluded. It's a bit difficult for me to say an awful lot about them because clearly we have to respect the confidentiality there. But yes, I would say that in terms of the mass, vast majority of legacy complaints, they have been dealt with, they have been concluded. Um, the, the ones, um, and there are a small number of individuals involved in the ones that are still outstanding, they are extremely complex in nature, there are a number of factors that are out with our control, um, and I think it probably depends on the conclusion of some other matters elsewhere. But I can certainly assure you that we are extremely keen to bring them to a conclusion. And um, also, of course, I would say very keen to make sure that the appropriate learning comes from um, a full analysis of them as well. Thank you. Thanks. Margaret, if, and if you cover something we've already covered, we'll let you know. <laughs> OK, you can let me know. Um, apologies for my, my late arrival. Um, when the, the previous subcommittee meant the then PERC, um, head of PERC, Professor John McNeil, put on record, no one has sought to prevent me from carrying out my functions. Is that still the case? We have been challenged, uh, in particular, in one investigation that we've undertaken. I, I would like to put on record that to date, PERC have undertaken 91 investigations. So we are talking uh, in relation to one investigation in particular that has been challenging. I think when Professor McNeill appeared
appeared at the committee last time, it was a very early stage of PERC. We have obviously matured. We've undertaken a number of investigations since then. And again, Professor McNeill indicated that the early period was going to be a period of assessment to identify whether or not any additional powers may be required. <coughs> and if there were, and if there was a weight of evidence uh, to suggest that we'd been hindered or hampered in any investigation, uh, we would undertake discussions with the Scottish Government in relation to that. The investigation which I, I speak about, and obviously I require to discuss this in general terms, um, obviously has caused us to reflect, and we are always constantly reviewing the terms of the legislation and the powers that are available to us in light of practical experience. And I think that it may be worthy that the Scottish Government potentially look at whether or not the, um, there would be an option to consider a precognition on oath of witnesses um, where they were not being as cooperative, perhaps, as we would like. Possibly another member's bill down the line next session. Um, I understand that the Police and Public Order and Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2006 doesn't authorise the Commissioner to publish a report on a Crown Office director investigation. Now, just in general terms, obviously, there's a pertinent um, point here which you know we, we will not touch on, but how then are lessons learned made transparent and you know the public interest served yes you are right that in crown directed uh, investigations i produce a report which goes to the lord advocate and he then has the opportunity to consider the information placed before him and determine whether or not a fatal accident inquiry is appropriate or whether criminal proceedings are appropriate and in those circumstances, the evidence would be tested in court and uh, brought forward for further um, consideration. Okay. Uh, and would it be made public, the lessons learned? It's really the lessons learned from an investigation when the report itself isn't to be made public. Well, the evidence would be rehearsed in court and in a fatal accident inquiry, you'll be familiar that the sheriff would be issuing a determination at the end of that, which would identify salient uh, matters. Okay. I don't know if anyone's touching this, but in its submission, the SPF is highly critical of the adversarial approach taken by Burke in its investigation. Could you perhaps comment on that and the, the procedures and processes involved? Personally, I think that's quite, quite um, comforting. Yes, I do. Well, I, I don't think that's very helpful to say that at all. Okay. I have to say. I can tell the committee that the PERC investigators approach all investigations uh, with an open mind. Uh, the purpose of our investigations is to establish all the available evidence and present the, the facts in an impartial manner. All our investigations are evidence-based, and this is reflected in terms of the reports which we produce, some of which you'll appreciate are supportive of the police position and others are critical. It is presented, and they are presented in a balanced fashion. I suppose for adversarial, I would um, be reading robust, and um, I think it's good. So we've got single police force, you know, there's various aspects of looking at complaints, mm -hmm. and various aspects that seem to me not quite right. I wonder if anyone's touched an SP investigating its own board members and its own procedures. Okay, I'll leave that. Yeah. Well. I have to say that uh, I, I know Mr. Finney uh, said, said exactly the same. I disagree with what has been said uh, by Mrs. Mitchell around about that. I want to point out um, uh, some of the, the points that the SPA have made about PERC, and they've, they've said that they're fast losing confidence in the effectiveness and genuine independence of PERC. Uh, uh, so, uh, SPF, sorry, I beg your pardon, which <laughs> is really concerning. A further paragraph, it says, Our members have reported examples of being interviewed for hours on end without rest, and one apparent witness reported that they were only able to use a toilet during a seven-hour interview interrogation, provided they were accompanied by a PERC investigator. Quite simply, these types of oppressive and dehumanising activities risk fatally undermining the PERC and should have no place in any fair investigatory process. Now, 
considering that this person was a witness, do you think that that kind of scenario um, is the right way to conduct business? I think, as uh, Mrs Alder has already alluded to, um, this information presented by the SPF was <laughs> submitted to the committee last week. Um, I have particularly asked the, the Federation to supply specific information to support that perception, and to date I haven't received it. Um, but I take it that when you do receive it, that you will be investigating um, this allegation. Um, and I think it would be useful, convener, for uh, our subcommittee uh, to get uh, the, uh, the uh, final uh, report uh, on that. Because that kind of thing, um, I have to say, that is a very, very serious allegation indeed. Um, it doesn't sit particularly uh, well with me. Um, and I, th I do think, convener, uh, that we need to explore that further uh, and find out exactly what the outcome of any investigation is. I do look forward to receiving the information from the, the Police Federation. As you'll appreciate, it's not possible to be prescriptive about the length of any interviews that are undertaken. The intention, of course, would be to undertake them as quickly as possible. But again, where the matter is complex or covers a number of matters, it will, on occasion, interviews will take a considerable length of time. And I can assure the committee that um, PERC investigators are well aware um, of the need to have comfort and refreshment breaks, not only for the, the purpose of the witnesses, but also for the interviewers themselves. And it certainly is not practice uh, to accompany a witness uh, during one of those breaks. Uh, yes, and, and it's also in relation to the concerns that have been raised that were in part addressed by uh, Chief Superintendent Auld. Similarly, it would be good to hear back from Police Scotland on the, a, a report back to the committee on that. Um, is, is there a linkage, if I may ask, be, between the two? Your investigators, if they've come from a background where such practices, uh, and, and I did say if, if they've come from a background where such practices were seen to be um, the norm, that's not what the public are looking for. The public understand that public officials, not least police officers, have considerable powers, should be subject to rigorous testing. But fairness, the overriding, consider of fairness, overriding consideration of fairness, indeed that's the words out of the guidance that were used in relation to the 1996, an overriding consideration of fairness to the subject constable. That's, that's basic human rights. That's, that's just, uh, I hope you're going to robustly pursue this. I can assure the committee that in relation to witnesses that are interviewed by PERC, they are treated in a professional manner, with dignity, and are treated fairly. And you'll understand then that there may be concerns in some quarters that not only um, do you feel that, um, well, people will be very, let me just be direct, people will be very concerned that you're asking for additional powers no, of, I, I ask uh, the committee. in relation to recognitions. No. I think I suggested that the committee may wish to reflect on that and the government would be uh, the body responsible for providing those powers. Yes, but you, that's what you would want. Because, you see, I, I'm one of the individuals who asked, and will not discuss a particular case, but I asked if you had sufficient powers, because I would be concerned if you didn't have sufficient powers to do what the public expectation is of you. But I don't you'd have more powers if they're... If, individuals who are subject to your attention. If I could rewind back to what I, what I actually said, Mr Finney, which was that at the time the former commissioner appeared, it was early days, he assured you at that time the powers that were in operation and that he was operating with were sufficient. I also pointed out that we had undertaken 91 investigations, one of which has proved to be testing, but there is no weight of evidence as yet that would suggest that we have been hindered in any of our investigations. So you don't need additional powers? It's on the record, actually, uh, on, on this one. So, uh, you know, if, if you could feed back to the committee, if you have additional before this subcommittee ceases Absolutely. to exist at the end of March, if there's additional information that we could get from I, on either of these issues, we would be very grateful for it. I think you should go back to Margaret. Can we interrupt Margaret in the middle of her... Or, uh, yes, it was just on the SPA and um, where they investigate <laughs> board member complaints against, against board members and procedures. Is uh, just comment on that. It doesn't seem ideal. 
Uh, well, the, the part of our role is to, uh, we don't actually investigate or complaints, review. but what we will do is we will deal with and process complaints. And yes, there have been a small number of complaints which have included complaints against SPA officers, SPA policies and procedures, and also some SPA board members. And the approach that we take in there would be that it would go through just the normal complaints process. Clearly, if any board members were the subject of a complaint, they included that would be a conflict of interest. They would declare that and they would completely absent themselves from any involvement in that. That has happened and there's a consistent and robust approach taken in that respect. Um, in terms of the preliminary assessment, that would then go forward. Um, a decision uh, uh, would be made and then they would follow on in accordance with whatever that decision was. We have not um, we've not had a position or a set of circumstances where, you know, um, a large group of uh, board members were conflicted. Clearly, it's not impossible that that would happen, and then we, I think we would then have to decide how we would deal with it to ensure that, um, you know, there was no conflict uh, of interest which we, could even be perceived as compromising that process. Do you have any figures about, you know, numbers of, of complaints and what they related to and if the outcomes were satisfactory? Um, I don't have the figures with me. I will endeavour to get hold of those figures and I will supply them to the subcommittee. That would be helpful. Thanks. Kevin, you had some other questions, but I, I, was it on something we've already discussed? Or I, 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 want, I want to, to continue on um, with the perk scenario. Yeah. The, because the problem, Kevin, is, is, is that we only have a quarter of an hour uh, left and we haven't done anything on data protection. Very, which very, was yeah, very briefly, though, yeah. um, because, again, um, from the SPF, they say we consider that the perk has a great deal of work to do to build confidence with the police service that it is capable of dealing with police officers, whether as witnesses or suspects, fairly. Can I ask uh, Ms Frame how they are going to build uh, that confidence uh, with police officers? Yes, the lack of confidence uh, which is spoken about uh, recently, I believe, is very much a matter of perception. Uh, it is unhelpful. Uh, I have a dedicated team who are working hard to meet the demands of their role. I have confidence in them and the work they're doing. Not only have they received positive feedback, both from the Lord Advocate and Police Scotland itself, and I think it should be borne in mind that each of the 62 recommendations made in investigation reports have in fact been accepted by Police Scotland, so there should be some confidence built in there. Additionally, from the evidence which we have gathered in investigations, that has already been tested in some cases in court and has been commented on favourably. But, but you talked at the initial stage there in your answer about perception. Mm -hmm. How are you going to get rid of that perception? What are you going to do? What are you going to undertake to, uh, to ensure um, that folks' uh, perceptions that they're being treated unfairly disappear. We're going to continue to robustly and professionally deal with witnesses and suspects. In relation to the police officers that you talk about being interviewed as witnesses, in advance of them being interviewed by PERC staff, <coughs> they receive a leaflet which details what the role of the PERC is. Additionally, the basis on which they can be interviewed and it sets out that they will be treated in the same way as the law is applied to members of the public. I find <clears throat> it surprising that uh, officers themselves who are applying that process to members of the public appear to have some difficulty in understanding it themselves when subject to being interviewed. I, I, I really do think, <laughs> convener, um, that uh, Ms. Frame needs to reflect on some of these things because I think um, the approach that is being taken seems to me to be confrontational. Um, and I think here what is required is a clearing of the air um, between all parties involved um, and discussion about how these processes take place. And I think that Mr. Finney hit upon it earlier on what is required here is fairness and the same attitude towards police officers 
as towards members of the public who may be appearing uh, as witnesses um, or, uh, or in other matters. And I really do think that there, that needs to be reflected upon. And I think that we, as a subcommittee, probably need to come back to this, convener. Sorry, at some point. It is necessary, however, for the Scottish Police Federation to provide the evidence, sure. both to Police Scotland and to, the, uh, to Park, in order for these investigations to, be, to take place. And unfortunately, of course, SPF isn't here today, but I think that whether there's some mechanism that we could encourage them to pass on information about particular cases to enable these investigations to take place. Can I ask about data protection? That was something which was brought up by the SPF at the last session. Police they were concerned that um, fairly significant numbers of police officers are falling foul of data protection uh, uh, offences and being automatically having to be referred on to the Lord Advocate. And uh, I just wondered, uh, Police Scotland had suggested that they might be able to provide figures, but also uh, the SPF's view is that little has changed over the last couple of years in terms of police officers being accused of data protection offences. Yeah, and hopefully I can provide members with some assurance of the work that's been ongoing in relation to information management related offences and investigations um, of the number of restricted officers that the committee last met and had evidence from. Uh, there is still a fair significant amount of officers on that restricted duties list, albeit less by way of percentage than there were this time in February 2015 when evidence was last provided. There has been a rollout of training for all officers about lawful systems usage for officers and police staff across the whole of Police Scotland. Uh, I think we're at the 18,000 officers mark now, uh, given awareness training both in person and through electronic Moodle training, which is the terminology used for all online training that has to be rolled out across the force. And significantly, there has been a full review of data protection, particularly around about investigations where DPA features and on the restricted officers list, and as we uh, refer into the Scottish Police Authority through our quarterly conduct uh, committee meetings, we review that regularly to ensure proportionality. And where there is a DPA offence, more than the, the vast majority of investigations that are ongoing just now, that DPA offence accompanies an index offence for an investigation that's been brought forward where the officer or member of staff has actually misused systems in relation to the investigation that's ongoing. Perhaps that might be through an assault or some other matter and they have unlawfully accessed systems. Um, and obviously, as far as Lord Advocate's guidelines are concerned, we must refer all criminal allegations to the Crown. And that is the matter uh, which conflicts slightly, I would suggest, with Regulation 9, which suggests under the new 2014 regs that reasonable inference of criminality, which I would argue is a lesser threshold than the no discretion position of the 2002 <coughs> Lord Advocates Guidelines. And we have reviewed all the investigations and the proportionality around about DPA is only for those offences for the period that the officer is under investigation and not, as was previously <coughs> provided by my SPF colleague, the nosy officer scenario, which were the words used last year. Um, that has been absolutely eradicated. We accepted that some 10 years ago when systems were ruled out, that we, officers were encouraged to use the system. That does not feature in our DPA investigations, and I can give members that assurance and confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr Ross, the SPA stated in the submission that it pays particular attention to information regarding officers placed in restricted duties due to alleged data protection breaches. Uh, are you satisfied with the information you're receiving? Uh, we've, we've been looking at this issue perhaps going back quite some time and we continue to, to seek reassurance and a full explanation of the reasons for officers being in restricted duties. And we also look at the statistics as well. Um, I think there has been a slight decrease um, uh, but we will continue to examine that. Uh, to this point in time, I think we understand the reasons behind it. We understand some of the duties that exist. We understand the need in terms of the compliance with the Lord Advocate's guidance, and we will continue to monitor that, monitor that closely. Alison, you had further questions. Uh, I, I, I just really want to um, distance myself from what Mr Stewart said. I don't think we have the evidence in front of us to make such strong statements as you've just made. And it's important that we um, recognise the independence of PERC. Um, I think that's absolutely vital. 
I think, it's, uh, I think we have got to look at the allegation that has been made here, uh, and I think that we need to come back to it. Um, it may well be that that allegation is unfounded. If that is the case, um, you know, that is what we will have to deal with. But uh, I think that we have got to. We would be failing in our duty not to follow up on what is a very serious allegation. This is an evidence session, not a debate yeah. between members at the moment. So um, certainly I think we have a, a commitment from the witnesses that we will provide information if, if, if they get the information which is, is provided. I had one s uh, slight question, I suppose. It's been put to me that they, the system that we operate in terms of complaints against the police is a bit complicated as far as the complainer understanding who investigates what. Uh, is there a case for other complaints other than those which, which can be resolved at the front li line to be directed through the park and then, then uh, redirected to the appropriate organisation. Do you think there would be any merit in that? There may be some merit in one organisation uh, assuming that responsibility. I think it would have to be balanced off about the level of bureaucracy in relation to redirecting some of uh, the work back to other organisations. Does the police and SBA feel about that? If, I mean, because there's always a suspicion around pe people investigating themselves. Um, you know, would that be helpful or would... Well, I think the point to make is, particularly in terms of our role, and particularly if you look at mm -hmm. chief officer investigations uh, uh, and SPA officer and board investigations, we do not investigate ourselves. Mm -hmm. But what we do have, and I think it's quite logical, if you are an employer, you will conduct part of the complaint process and you will take that through, in our case, the preliminary assessment. And at that stage, you would then take whatever is the appropriate next steps. I certainly think that if you are an employer, then it is not illogical that you should have a role in terms of the management of that complaint process. Of course, it's vital that it's seen as being transparent, fair and robust. The other thing I think is an important point is the way in which people can clearly access the complaint process. And that's something that we've certainly put a lot of time and effort into. And, and I think you know, we've progressed that significantly. I think there's still room for further improvement. I think the difficulty is um, where people make contact with something where the name police appears, it's making sure that you can actually assist them so that they can identify <coughs> who then deals with that particular complaint. And certainly uh, within the SPA, we've put a great deal of, of effort in trying to make sure that is smooth and as clear as possible, because certainly the, you know, in terms of the signposting and the way in which people target their complaint to the particular body, there have been some issues in the past, but it is improving, but there's room for further improvement. Yes, yeah, from, the, from Police Scotland's perspective, I think from, uh, from our position, absolutely for me, frontline resolution, the complaints ombudsman has favourably commented on the Police Scotland position there. Where that actually sits for me, is pretty moot. I would be comfortable with however it's captured. Um, and that's the rationale that we've approached in terms of notwithstanding whether there's a, an actionable complaint at the FLR frontline resolution, and almost half of those are resolved at that level, we still capture that as a complaint. We record it on the six-stage form. It's accessible and transparent for audit from both SPA and PERC's perspective, should any audit come forward. And it's there to retrospectively examine around about our rationale and learning and finding and what the outcome was. Only 1.6 of all individuals who have resolutions achieved through frontline resolution come back to the organisation seeking some clarity on points. I think the expeditious nature of the concept, wherever that may sit here, is something that I would be comfortable with. I'll, I'll be absolutely take on board Mr Ross's point that the complaint would naturally need to be pushed towards Police Scotland for that specialist technical knowledge piece to answer the quality of service matter or whatever that may be, particularly in criminal matters. Thanks for that. Can I invite any further questions? Oh, okay. Just very a general kind of question. Obviously, investigating complaints or dealing with complaints takes up a, a, an enormous amount of time, and that comes at a cost as well. And I wonder if you were aware of the apologies legislation about to be discussed next week at Stage 3, where you can express regret, acknowledge something has happened, say you're sorry, and undertake to look into the incident. Would that be helpful, you think, in um, aiding an earlier resolution and one that's more satisfactory to the general public. Forgive me, I'm not cited on all of that, but I would be most definitely interested in it. It's certainly an un 
legislative piece of work that we do just now in, in terms of um, our expressions of apologies uh, for those complaints that we uphold. So that would be most helpful to be okay. involved in that dis discussion. Anyone else? I, I, I also am not familiar with the detail of it, but the principle, as you've described, is one that certainly um, I think I would agree with. I would also make the point that I think it's important, and it's something I certainly feel the SPA does do, is if, if uh, a, a mistake has been made, and it's important to make that very clear and to express that in a full and appropriate manner to the complainer, and we have done that. And similarly, um, from Pert's position, the complaint uh, handling reviews that we see, uh, we regularly see that Police Scotland make apologies initially on recognition of their errors. Flagging up her uh, stage three of her bill, like the admissibility <laughs> might help more, even uh, more apologies. Finally, any further questions from any members? No. But we'll have to. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much to the witnesses for your your appearance. Thank you. Thanks to the chief. Thank <laughs> you.